boy howdy this is this is shaney merst here and we're doing a an udon monthly bowl with valgan over there say hi valgan hi valgan hi valgan Aha, fun and original comedy <laughs> valgan and i are going to take a world which was sdk2 and convert it to sdk3 complete with all the cool things that was happening in the sdk2 world so this will be fun um let's talk a little bit about going from sdk2 to sdk3 first it's a nightmare i would suggest not doing it um <laughs> Uh, we it, spent about it is a little bit easier to start from scratch. <laughs> yes, we we spent about four hours flailing around with an error from some sort of avatar thing about some sort of audio source, which makes no sense because we don't have any avatars in this scene. So after uninstalling SDK two, which you close Unity, you don't have Unity open. You go into the VRC SDK Explorer window here, and you delete it when Unity is closed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you would also delete its folder that would exist in the plugins folder. But that yep. does that's not everything. You would also have to go through every single one of your thingies that have a VRC SDK trigger. Now, let's say this book decimated had a VRC SDK trigger. You have to go into there and delete it. The fastest way to find triggers is going up to your hierarchy on the top left and pushing T colon scripts. It's just looking for scripts, scripts because in this version, they'll all show up as a missing script, which just confuses Unity. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. So when you put in T scripts, you'll get a list of things with scripts on them. You can't highlight them all unless they're all the exact same script. So you might have to go through groups of things that you know are the same script and then come over to the right side here and start removing them. Um, but once those are all removed, boy, howdy, that's not it. No. You also may have to go to edit and go to project settings and then you'll find this nightmare. And then when you're in this nightmare, you go player. Yep. Player is the right player. One. Play on yep. the left here, and these might not all be open, or they may be open, something or other. You will have to dig through things to find this line right here, scripting define symbols. You'll see here I have Udon in VRC SDK, VRC SDK 3. You'll also find VRC SDK, VRC SDK 2, or something equivalent, something that says SDK 2, and you'll want to remove mm -hmm. that. And once you remove that and press enter, and then you can close the project settings. You should have no errors. And if you do, press clear and... Oh, no. Oh, whew, that was a, yeah, that no, was a, that that was a quick that one. Was yeah. Uh, so the actual issue that is coming up there, uh, not this one, but the one where you have to delete the old SDK2 one, is there's a lot of code that's shared between SDK2 and 3. And which of that code is being utilized is dependent on which keyword is in that slot so if it says sdk2 in there then i'll think okay i'm free to use the avatar sets of these scripts and if it says sdk3 it just completely ignores avatar sets we had the key codes for both of them in there because this project had previously used sdk2 and had placed that keyword in there there's no way to auto upgrade with a new Unity package. So like if you installed VRC SDK 3 and Udon stuff, there's no way on VRChat side for them to remove that keyword. So you would have to go in and do it manually on your own side, which is just one of the reasons why it's easier to do it as a new project. <laughs> so after we cleared out the SDK 2, we went and downloaded the latest SDK 3 from vrchat.net. You just go into the download section of after you log in and grab SDK3. And you should be able to run the Unity package and just push OK, and it'll install it. And you will pray that it indeed still maintains no errors. And mm -hmm. then what we're going to do here is we are going to be using Udon Sharp to do some basic coding. Udon Sharp is just a lot more stable at the moment because it's basically just using real scripting. Because the back end of Udon is actually pretty solid. It's the visual front end that has a lot of uh, glitches and the likes at the moment. Basically, Udon Sharp just writes some code and turns it into the thing that Udon turns nodes into. <laughs> So it, it's a funny little workaround, and from a coder's perspective, a lot easier to use than nodes. It might be a bit more intimidating to someone who doesn't program. Like uh, me. But yeah, <laughs> which, which is why I'm here. <laughs> Instead, we're going to start in installing Udon Sharp. And when you go to the website for Udon Sharp, which is github.com slash Merlin Sanchez slash Udon Sharp, or you can just type in Udon Sharp 
into Google because that's a lot faster. It will actually probably bring you to here and you'll go to releases, which currently it's at 64. By the time you get to it, it'll probably be 66 because it updates it all the time. Seven days ago, four days ago, 21 hours ago. So yeah, when, when you're working on your Udon worlds, make sure you're using the latest version of Udon Sharp. Always come back around. Mm -hmm. So I've already downloaded the Udon Sharp Unity package and I'm going to go here into downloads. And I'm going to click the button, and it should just bring it in. Looks good to me. Import. And now nice. we're going to write some packages, and we're going to do some things, and we're going to compress all the stuff. While we're writing the package items, I also suggest go grab Visual Studio Code. Uh, Valgan suggested it if you cannot find mm -hmm. something that you pay for. Uh, Visual Studio Code is free, and it seems to be really cool and I like it. So mm -hmm. download for Windows and uh, install it. And we will, I, I guess we should configure Visual Studio Code now to work with Unity. By default, Unity uses just Visual Studio, which is missing a few features from Visual Studio Code. You have to figure out how Unity launches it defaultly through a different program. Because when you have a script, you just double click it. And then Unity is like, okay, let's look at this external program to launch it through. So I believe you go to edit and Preferences, probably. Preferences. External tools. And right at the top, we change Visual Studio to uh, Browse. Um, I went into Start. Uh, you won't see it because it's kind of off the screen here. But I went to Start and then right-clicked on Visual Studio Code. And I went to More and then Open File Location. And what that does is it pulls up the shortcut. And all you got to do is right-click on the shortcut, go to Properties, and copy the target without the quotes. Mm -hmm. pretty pretty cake and then this should come up as visual studio code as the external script editor and that does that mean it's going to work now yeah that was easy okay that's unusual thanks unity <laughs> all right so now that we have that so we have udon we have the sdk3 we have now our editor correctly assigned and now we're going to go a little bit through this and show what we're going to try to do and hopefully accomplish it so yeah. here's here's the world it has a lot of things in here let's just go to the easiest thing first probably um over here we used to have an animator you used to have a standalone animation component which ah, has been yes. dropped uh and in fact wasn't used much in fact in 1.710 wait is 1.710 minecraft <laughs> 2017 there we go 2017 is the one that I believe that they started now no longer using it. So what All this right. light used to do, this light would flicker, which would dance these shadows uh, right here, which is a really cool effect. We'll go to the next thing that we're going to try to do. Uh, over here, we have a lot of buns, uh, and there's no real working kitchen in here, so they just come out of the magical thin air, and they land in this little pile. And when you are done with them, and you have done your devouring or whatever... Ooh, that would be an interesting one to add, making it so things actually get, get eaten. That'd be pretty cool. Um, yeah, oh, that'd be cool. Uh, if you choose not to eat them, you can throw them in the sink, and they will respawn back up here and drop into our little makeshift bucket, basket, basket. Yes. It's a simple respawn from there up to there. What else? Oh, yeah. We have, or we had, a mirror button here. And when you push the button, it would open a mirror. VRC SDK doesn't have a trigger system anymore, as you know. So we're going to make a Udon Sharp C Sharp thingy to make it turn on and off. It's a t it'll be yep. a toggle. <laughs> we also have chairs. So these chairs will have a VRC chair, essentially, added or removed when you push the toggle button. For enabled and disabled, not added or removed, yep. but whatever. Um, we're also going to do a whole bunch of pickups. So we'll be able to pick this up. I'll be able to pick that up. I'll be able to pick this up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and carry it around. And those can also be washed in the sink and respawned. And in this little closet here, we also have a very sophisticated for the area toilet. And this little seat will open and close. And the last thing, I believe, is we will have a light intensity thing for the moon. There have been complaints for different 
headsets and keyboard players where the moon is either too bright or too dark or one or the other. So over here, we'll have a nice little thing that has, you know, moon intensity and you'll be able to slide it. And that's everything. So we have like five or six things to accomplish in here to take this world from SDK2 to SDK3. So yeah. where do you want to start, Valgan? I think the easiest one that we can get out of the way is the animation for the light flickering. So I believe you still have the animation file for the light. Uh, yes. Yeah, similar to the scene hierarchy, uh, oh. you can do uh, T colon animation or something like that, if you like. Look at that. Amazing. Yep. All right. So mm -hmm. click on the light source that you have in your All scene. right. Add, do add component and do animator. All right. Animator. So, yep. Now drag the light into the gap. The, oh, the into same the gap. Empty place as before. Perfect. Now what this does is it generates a controller that has the animation in it. And that that's it. Huh. Yep. So if you go to your animator tab, Boop. the only thing in there is the light. So I guess just make sure the light loops and it should be good. How do I verify the looping? It would have a little thing on the far right. But legacy animation. Okay. Do you ever, like, remember something that you should have just noticed right away, but then you notice later on? Uh, go to your animator page. You got it. Click that light. There's no motion data in this. That's where the light animation was supposed to go. Click the dot on the right and just, like, click light. The legacy animation the legacy click light animation can be used in the state light. Oh, so this is a different type of animation file. Okay, so what we do instead is, on the left, we select light in your hierarchy. Now you hit create in the animation tab. Oh, this one. Yes. Duh. Yep. We'll call this light two. Hello, right, light two. Now select light one in your project settings. You'll need access to both your project and your animation tab at the same time. Oh, I actually have two projects here, which is perfect. Animation project. Oh, I... Okay. <laughs> don't, don't ask questions. Light. And it's an animation. There we are. All right. Just select the first one. Got it. All right, now highlight and select all of the nodes in here. So yeah, I just control A and that and select like everything. And we'll copy that. Control C copies it. And we'll go into the light two one. Paste it in here? Uh, yeah, yeah, this should work actually. Delete light and we'll just keep light two. You got it. Perfect. All right, now this has light two in it, which is the animation we just made. Since we got rid of the old one, this is now the default one. So if we go back to scene, hit play. Look at that. Hey, there we go. The light wiggles and makes the shadows perfect. I'm actually surprised that was a legacy animation component because those quite literally have not been a feature since like 5.63, I believe. Yep, that's when uh, this was made. <laughs> <laughs> so Good. Most of you probably won't be running into that issue if yes. you're coming from 2017. So essentially what happened was that the legacy animation in was breaking in the animator but for avatars that still works is that the idea they were actually removed because of avatars there oh. was a way that you could modify a base animation component and use it to toggle through your player hierarchy or something to start modifying menu contents oh it wasn't a good thing <laughs> it was in fact uh giving people access to the ban player buttons and stuff Hmm. So, so they removed that <laughs> that's a good call very good idea yeah. so our light works and now we are here yes. inside and do you want to do the mirror next that's the second easiest thing yeah yeah we can do mirror the easiest way to start with this is to just grab the mirror prefab and plop it down there you can just search mirror and i mean i could the vrc mirror there we are yep. and just drag that into your scene cool Nice. And we will rotate it so it's... Uh... You can hold the control to make it snap to five degree angles. To focus in on an object that you have selected, just press F. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Cool. Okay. And we're going to need a box, which is going to be our push button. So I could just copy, paste, and we'll change the icon for that later. And we're going to call this mirror... Mirror, mirror toggle. toggle. Do you like to use underscores? Depends on what I'm doing with. Well, that was a sentence. Depends on what I'm <laughs> using it for. I like to have the first word have an underscore between it and the rest of it. That's entirely like a preference thing. All right. So we got our button and we have right. the mirror. Now all we got to do is turn it on and off. In your project, we'll make a folder that we'll call scripts. 
And that's where we'll start putting our scripts in. You got it. Create folder scripts. Uh, double click in there and we'll right click and do new U sharp. U sharp script. Boom. We'll call this toggle underscore game object. All right. Why are we calling it toggle game object in particular? Because when we turn the mirror on and off, we'll be turning the game object itself on and off, depending on whether or not it is already on or off. We could have it be mirror specific, where it takes the VRC mirror reflection script and disables that. However, the VRC mirror reflection script doesn't have a variable that you can use yet in scripting. So we have to rely on just disabling the game object itself. Alrighty then. Plus this will be a lot more universal that you can just use with a lot of other things. And it will, with every time you make a modification to a script, a little spitting loading wheel in the bottom right will think for a bit. And sometimes your mirror will stop reflecting, which is perfectly fine. It's just VR chat was bad when they made the shader for it. <laughs> <laughs> it it'll work fine in game. Sometimes it'll just stop rendering in Unity. So select the button. Oh, the button, uh, yes. Yep. You see how we have a U-sharp and a C-sharp script here on the left? The C-sharp script is the actual script, and the U-sharp is basically just a case for the script. It, it just kind of sits there and like lets the script go through it. So there's two ways that you can add this to a game object. When you select the game object, uh, mm -hmm. you can either do add component and then you search udon behavior, which would be the typical normal way you would be doing it when you're starting with like, okay, I want an udon behavior on this before you do a script. But the way I like to do it is make my script first. And since the C sharp script is a normal script and uh, it shows up when you search things, you can just search toggle underscore game object or just toggle. Uh -huh. and you can you can hit enter on this and then it'll say wait convert to udon behavior and then it automatically puts it into an udon behavior slot right there wow that's that saves a lot of steps yeah you, you don't have to go searching through your project for wherever you hit it all right so now that we have the script double click on the c sharp one and this will launch it in uh visual studio code and it actually did it unity you genius c sharp extension is recommended for this file type what is Here, this? Press, pr press install. Okay, it is downloading package. That's fine. I don't need dot .net core. Disable that. We have to look for where we do plugins from. Extensions. All autocomplete. Install. It, it, it's on their website, so I assume it has to be real. All right. All right. So we're going to establish a couple variables first off. And we do that in the section after the public class toggle game object and all that, and before void start. So, okay, so right within these brackets. Void, yep. Uh, just hit enter a couple times. I typically like to keep one space between any segment of things that I'm doing. So I'll be like one further down. Yep. We want to have the game object that will be our target for what we'll be toggling on and off. And since we want to be able to access this game object from the inspector, it needs to be what's called public, which means other scripts can access it and other scripts can include the inspector. So we'll type public space game object. Game object has to be capitalized, actually. Because game object is a type of thing, correct? Yep. And we'll call this target with lowercase t and then semicolon. Semicolon right. always ends the statement. Yep. For now, that will be all. We'll go down a little bit. By default, it'll start us with an event, void start. We don't need that at the moment, so we can just delete that. And we'll do private void capital I interact. And this will be the interact method that will happen whenever you click on something. Private void just is establishing this as like an event. And the way we finish this off is parentheses at the end of it and then brackets and hit enter on that. And there we go. This is the space in which anytime you interact with the object and you run up and click on it, this section of code will happen. So we want to do one line in here. We will do target dot set active then this is technically a method as well. So we'll be giving this parentheses at the end and inside those parentheses is the value we'll be setting it to. And since we want to set it to the opposite of what it presently is, because if the object is on, we want to turn it off. And if the object is off, we want to turn it on. We'll do target dot 
active in hierarchy and the a itself is not capitalized while in hierarchy is so this gets its present value and we want to put a exclamation point before target so that any of the information that comes after that is inverted. So gotcha. target dot get active in hierarchy checks to see in the scene, is this object active and gives you a yes or a no. The exclamation point takes the yes and turns it into a no or vice versa. Essentially now, not target active in hierarchy, which means the opposite. Yep. Semicolon at the end. Yes. Cause we are ending yep. that statement. All right. Control S mm -hmm. and we will head back into unity. Now that we're returning to unity with a modified script, it once again has to compile it in, as you can see in the bottom, right? All right. Perfect. It'll throw up all these random things. Every time you compile something, you don't have to care about 90% of them. So we will go to your little orange button there that we're using to toggle the game object. And if you scroll down, you'll see it has a slot named target. Mm -hmm. Now you'll want to put the mirror object right into that slot. Grab the VRC mirror and drag it down into the target. Perfect. And since it's a mirror, I recommend having it off by default. <laughs> there we go. VRC mirror right. off. Since we're using Udon Sharp, we can actually simulate a uh, interact test in this instead of using just normal Udon. So if you hit play and then reselect the button, there's a little button on the Udon behavior script that we can select and then hit trigger interact. Ta-da! There we go. It and works. It on and off. That's a success. And that only took like two lines of code. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, a, a, a basic toggle is pretty nice. I don't know how I spent an entire half an hour for its tutorial. So all we did was we just did a public game object target and we made an interact and essentially the target is going to be active and set it to the opposite of what it is in the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> okay. That makes sense. How about next we make things pick up -able. Sure. Yeah, th this will just be you throw on a VRC pickup script onto them. And if you want them synced, the way you sync objects in here is by putting a Udon behavior component onto them because object sync has been merged into that component. So if you do add component, we'll just search pickup and we'll just add that. And then that gives you the normal default VRC pickup stuff, you can set it to disallow theft or anything if you don't care about that. But to sync its position, we'll do add component, boot on behavior, and then we'll click synchronize position. We don't need a Boom. script in here. We just need it for the position syncing. And there you go. If you save that as the prefab, you can have it overwrite all the other uh, little signs. Wow, that was it, really? Yeah. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely nuts so how do we overwrite the other ones uh scroll to the top of your inspector and there will be a little thing on the right that says overrides all right uh so this presently isn't a prefab so what you'll want to do is have a folder that you save prefabs into all right create folder prefabs nice. all right so grab that menu mesh and probably just change it to menu, menu. then just drag it from your hierarchy into the prefabs folder Boom. Now you can go through your scene and look for any other menu meshes and you'll delete them and place down new ones. I think the next thing we probably want to do is make the garbage, dis or not garbage disposal, the sink work. So if people remember the sinks design is to, you throw things in it and then it respawns the object. What, what does your sink have collider wise? Cause we're going to need to have a trigger collider on it that does the detection as to whether or not something's in it. And the sink destroyer is a simple box collider, which is on the bottom of the sink. So in scripts, we will have object respawn or something. But... So we'll create a Unity script called object uh, respawn? U sharp. yep. U sharp script, yes. All right, so object respawn. We'll open up this C sharp script. This is going to respawn an object if it has a rigid body on it. We're actually going to be utilizing a built-in system for VRChat for uh, respawning objects. It's the most consistent way that I've found to do it. So actually, if we go back to our scene and we need to make sure that the like respawn height thing actually sets to respawn height, search for uh, VRC world in the project. VRC world. Oh yeah, yep. look at that. Uh, grab the fancy one on the left. Yep. And 
put it in your scene. Probably place it wherever you want people to spawn at. Oh, that's also our spawner. Yep. Oh, okay. Then you can set its rotation. The blue arrow is what faces forward. All right. All right. And now respawn height Y is probably the one we're looking for. The only thing that we need to do is look at that number, understand that it is a number, and then have object behavior at respawn selected to respawn, which is default. We just need to make sure it's all on that. Also, as a quick heads up, the VRC World Prefab now comes with the player mod stuff on it, or they're not calling it VRC World Settings. So there's an Udon behavior on here that you can actually look at a bit. Okay, th this assembly code you'll never have to worry about. For some reason, it just defaults open. So right above the words assembly code is a little triangle that you can use to hide that. So all we care about is jump impulse, walk, and run speed. And the defaults can, are what we are used to. Yep, you can, you can put them to whatever you want. But actually, we're here because we wanted to make sure things respawn and guess what they do let's go back to our script all right so we won't need a void start so you can get rid of that in fact we won't need any variables or anything all we need is do private void on trigger enter and then the parentheses and brackets for our method we in those parentheses you'll want to put collider with a capital c and then the word other or something so this is just saying that when on, on trigger enter the other object that you are colliding with we are getting its collider and saving that as other and within this method we can refer to the other object just by using the term other. So on the next line, since this is a on trigger enter, there's one very important thing we have to do first, and that is a null check. A null check just checks to see if the object that you collided with exists, which sounds kind of dumb, but you have to do it because if you interact with the player, like if the player object hits the on trigger enter for security reasons, the player object will always return null when a script tries to access it. And if we don't check against it being null right away and it gets to be null, it just kills your entire script. Yikes. Yeah. So right away we have to do if parentheses other equals equals null outside of that parentheses, just type return. And that basically tells it. If the other object doesn't exist, go to the end of this method and forget about it. Now that we've done that, we can do what we actually care about. If other dot get component, do the two little carrots, the greater than or less than, and then inside of those carrots, uh, you want to put rigid body with a capital R. At this one, we're also doing a null check here just to see if the rigid body exists. So within this if check, exclamation point equals null. So we're, we're trying to see if it doesn't equal null. Yeah. Put a parentheses to close this if statement and we'll put in bracket uh, because this will be everything that happens after we do the if check. So if the other object has a rigid body on it, we are going to teleport it below that respawn height. We'll do other.transform.position equals new lowercase n vector three parentheses. And this is just going to be giving it a position that we are sending it to globally. So we'll put it at zero comma minus 1000 or something comma zero. Then we'll... And that's your x, y, z coordinates. Yep. And then we'll just put our semicolon there. And theoretically, if the object is placed into here, it'll be teleported below the respawn height, and then it'll just go back to whatever position it had originally. Gotcha. Okay, so let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about the blue other, the yellow get component, and then the green rigid body in here. How does this syntax work? What's happening here is other is the collider component of the object that you are colliding with. And since that collider component is on a transform, which is basically a game object, just its position information, we can check to see if that game object has a rigid body component attached to it. So we're doing a get component rigid body. Okay, so we understand how other get component rigid body is working. And we know we want to make sure that it's not null. Yep. And if that's Basically the case, just checking it exists. <laughs> yes. We're going to take that other, whatever yep. the other was, 
and we're going to transform its position. And well, okay. oh, sorry. <laughs> the transform is its basically position component on it. If you select an object in Unity, the first thing that you see on the top right in the uh, inspector is the transform component, which just says it's like position, rotation, and scale. You cannot remove this component because it's just innate with any object, but this is the component that we reference when we're getting uh, dot transform. So when we do dot transform dot position, we're getting the position information from the transform information on the object. Ah, so it's read backwards. A lot of scripting is read inverse. And then vector three is essentially, you're looking for a 3D vector space. Yep, essentially a vector three is just three floats, a, a float being a non-integer, so. Right, this is an example of a float here, negative 5.035. Yep, yep. So we have created object respawn.cs and we saved it and it compiled. So now what do we do? Uh, so in order to make this actually respawn objects, you'll need to, for one, we'll put the script on there. You can just do a quick search and do uh, object respawn in the add component. Just search object should be one of the first things. Yep. Indeed. Hit that, convert to it on behavior, and there we go. Now, the second thing we need to do is since this is doing collision checking, we will want to give this a rigid body. A rigid body just basically tells it, hey, physics are a thing let's look out for those uh you use them a lot for pickups or the likes so if you hit that and there you go it'll do collision checking however at the moment it will also just fall to the ground so what we need to do is press is kinematic this will tell it to ignore all velocity or physics or well, not physics but is kinematic if enabled the object will not be driven by the physics engine and can only be manipulated by its transform now, that sounds like it's turning itself off, but it's not, because having the rigid body there means it's thinking more, and that's what we need. Cool. All right, so let's go ahead and go into the SDK and do a build test. I need to, I need to W, but I only have two hands. Just lean forward. I know, right? Oh, that's an idea. I will do that. This is like a really bad game. Hey! hey did it. it now we need we can use this i assume we can use the same code yep. for this yeah because uh because it checks to see if it has a rigid body on it and all of these objects have rigid bodies as well so, so they do. the only thing you need to do is uh select the prefab for them and throw a uh vrc pickup on it oh yeah so how do you select prefabs that none of these are prefabs. These are no. just the models. One of those and put it onto the prefab we have here on the left. Yep. And that'll overwrite it. Oh. Now huh. on this prefab, we'll do add component and pick up. There and that's go. it. Yep. Amazing. Now you can pick these up and yeet them around. There we go. There, All now... of them are the prefab. Amazing. That's amazing. Perfect. I didn't know it was that easy to update a prefab. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Prefabs are pretty nice in 2018. Cool. All right, chair colliders. All right. Oh, wait, perfect. we need to make chairs first, actually. Do a project search for VRC chair. Three. So place it into one of your chairs. Put it on top. So we'll rotate it, to it. 180 rotation, yep. Yeah, that's why. Are your chairs prefabs? Probably not. Uh, all right, so we're going to we're gonna take these chairs, delete them all, and we're going to put this as a child of these chairs. So let's do yep. that. So I think we can make this a prefab. Yep, that's the goal right now. <laughs> all right, so I'll take this walnut chair and throw it in the prefabs folder. Children of a prefab can't be deleted or removed. Okay, I will remove you from a prefab. Well, I think you can do that. Okay, you can so, unpack the prefab, move its prefab connection. So you right-click there and do unpack. And that will basically tell it, okay, you're no longer a prefab instance anymore. We now have all a right. chair. Perfect. We'll now, delete the get other rid chair. of all of those dumb chairs. We don't need you anymore. Place walnut chair into your scene. All right. Uh, yikes. That is a really small chair. Yay! Now, uh, place a bunch of these chairs somewhere. All right, now we got chairs. The one that has uh, the prefab on top of it, we will be using as our prefab. Click the chair that we have here, like that actual wooden chair. Got it. All right. So this is Walnut Chair 3. Uh, take the VRC chair and put it as a child of Walnut Chair 3. 
This is going to be a drag. Aha. 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 Walnut chair three. Boom. Right. Now we're going to go into that prefab. So, like, just drop down in the graphics and graphics two. Both need to be turned off. Boom. Gone. Click walnut chair three and then do apply prefab. Apply wow. all. Yep. Now all the other chairs suddenly have a VRC chair in them. Magic. So now we have all the things that we want to turn off. Yes. Create new script. Toggle chairs. Awesome. Look at that. Let's open this yep. buddy. So now we're at toggle chairs and we're not going to use long coding of fancy stuff here. We're going to be using a manually en entered array until the magical find objects of type. Once uh, this works, we'll be able to create an array of chairs just based on the fact that there are chairs, which will be really cool. So when you add more chairs, you'll be able to add more chairs to the array without having to change the code. That'll be really cool. There's more than likely a way that we could do it. I just haven't the foggiest on how you would. We'll, uh, we'll add to this in a, in a comment uh, if we figure it out. All uh, right, so we're going to toggle these chairs. How are we going yep. to do it? We are going to do this in a very similar way to the way we toggled the mirror, only we're going to do it for multiple objects at once. Scrap the void start event. All right. And we're going to have a public game object targets. Now, the way we turn this into an array is by putting brackets after game object. So right after T, put a left and right bracket. This basically just creates an array. Actually, I'll, I'll show you how this works. So control S to save, and we'll go back into Unity. Select the button that we're using. Put the toggle chairs script onto here. Convert to Udon behavior. And you see in public variables, there's targets and it's got a little drop down arrow next to it. Yes. So if we hit that, we can set that to be any size. So let's just put it at 10 for now or something. And this gives you 10 different slots that you can put a new game object into. And this will be where we're placing all of the chairs and stuff. For right now, we'll leave these blank and we'll put the chairs in when we're done writing the script. Let's head back to our script. We are going to want a private void interact. Uh, capital I, and we'll have the parentheses at the end, and we'll bracket. All right. Why are we so, highlighted already? It's a yellow thing. It it gets a little bit like, oh, you should be using like overrides and stuff for this. You you don't have to use overrides. We're going to we're going to be referring to them the same way as we refer to any other method. In the event that some of the objects that are in the array are differently enabled than the others. Like if a few of the chairs are active and a few of them are inactive, do you want them to all be changed to active or inactive or just toggle it based on its original status? I'd probably say that when people want the chairs either on and off, they want them either on or off. And since they right. default on, if some of them are for some reason off, we should just set them all to off when you push the button. So we are going to want a private bool up in our variables again, oh, not here. You got it. We'll call this is active. If you don't tell it a value, it defaults to false, which Perfect. I believe your chairs are starting at active. So Correct. Or private bool will do is active equals true. Can you also do one? Uh, no, this is not Python. Oh, of course. On interact, is active equals opposite of is active. So essentially it's saying if it's, if it's active, make it not inactive. We're going to set up a for loop. This will be checking the entire array for all the different things that are in it. And we'll be doing something to each one of them. It's better to use for loops than for each loops, just because for loops actually compute a little bit faster than for each's. Though you could use a for each loop in this because we're just doing the same thing to every object in it. Uh, but we'll just be using a for loop for now. In this instance, we have to tell it how we want to count to iterate through all of the different things that we're doing. So for and then in parentheses, we'll do int i equals zero, semicolon. i is less than targets.length, semicolon. 
i plus plus so what's happening here is we're establishing a number at zero uh if that number is less than how many objects are in the targets array we'll bump that number up by one we'll have a set of brackets that happen after this for loop so that this will essentially happen the amount of times that there are objects in that array so pop some brackets down and i this might make a bit more sense once we actually write what's going on in here targets brackets and then in the brackets press i and then after this dot set active parentheses is active and then semicolon basically targets is an array an array is basically like a list a list is another thing in programming but that's not something we can use so for us arrays are lists all of those objects have a number of like which in the list they are starting at zero let's say targets and then the n value number one of that array is the one that we're presently on for this for loop we're setting that game object specifically to be active or not active this array ties back to the public variables that we have over here on the right. So if we stuff this full of chairs, we'll have nine, no, sorry, 10. All zero all the way to nine is 10, 10 chairs. So this public game object targets is going to be a list of 10 things. So it's going to start at zero and oh, the targets.length is 10. So it's going to do this 10 times to the whole array or once per element. Right. And whatever present time that it's on, it'll use that count as which one it's modifying. All right, that's your script. Cool. All right, we'll save it. And we'll stuff this full of elements. You can go up to your hierarchy and just search VRC chair and just drag them individually from there. So all these it, puppies right here. Yep, these are the reasons I like to have my hierarchy right next to the inspector. Sure, that's one way to move it. <laughs> If it if it's silly and it works, then it's silly and it works. There we go. Now we have one, two, three, four, five, five chairs. And here we have one, two, three, four, five chairs. So when we push this button, all these chairs will become inactive. Correct. However, right now we have it set to 10 and there's five empty values in that. Mm. And when you have an empty value in it, it is null. And as I was saying earlier, if it runs into null, it's going to just cancel the script. So there's two things we can do. We can either A, just make sure that all of these are always filled in and just modify the size, or we can put a quick null check inside of the script itself. It sounds like we did a we did that for toggle game objects. We should probably do that for toggle, toggle chairs as well. And we did it for the object respawn instead. It sounds like this null thing is pretty important. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right before targets I set active, we'll put, we'll put another line. If in parentheses targets bracket i we're checking to see if this section of the array actually has something in it equals equals null actually no we don't want to do that because return actually in this sense will immediately cancel the for loop and will not iterate through the rest of them we're actually going to do if targets i does not equal null then we'll do the next line so if you go to the end of this line hit delete there we go. All right. So, so if if it's not if, null, then do the thing. Yep. And if right. it is null, it'll just go to the next one. Yep. Perfect. Makes sense. There cool. Save. Compile programs just because. And this is one we can actually just check in the inspector since we have the trigger interact button. If you hit play, we'll boot her up. And then in the hierarchy, since the VRC chairs are invisible for us, uh, we'll just search VRC chair and then go over to the inspector and press trigger interact. And they and change. Yeah. Nice. Perfect. You can push it all day. Oh, yeah. I think I might have broke it. No, no, it's not broken. It's fine. Easy. That's cool. So yeah, now so then if you add another chair, you just add the chair to the array and it'll automatically know what you're doing and it'll do it. We have two things left to do, I think. The this... uh toilet and the light slider. That's correct. Let's take a look at how this toilet was supposed to work. So we have the bathroom and it has things. And we have the toilet, and the toilet has the top, and it has the bottom. Is there still animations for that? I see there's an animator controller on here. If you click on the controller, it should take us to whatever folder. All right, select one of those animations. All right. And drag the WC Hot Law Pock from the scene. Drag right. that into the little preview in the bottom right. Got ya. All right, now press play, and we'll see 
yep, that still works and everything. Which means we have an animator controller with animations that work, unlike we did with the light earlier. Let's go to our animator and check out. So like, there we go. Look, what do you have set up here? Simple. <laughs> Um, uh, <laughs> okay, let's change this a bit. Instead of using two different triggers, we'll do use a single bool called enabled. Okay, so we'll go here and do a bool and call it enabled. And just delete your other two triggers. Select the one going from close to open. This yeah, one here. And we'll set the transition condition to be enabled equals true. Conditions. Yep, enabled. Enabled. True. Equals true. Perfect. Since we have a condition on it leaving, we want to disable its ability to automatically leave. So we want to turn off has exit time, which is that check mark at the top. Now we want to do the same thing for the other transition, only have it be enabled false. Do the drop down on the settings here, right under has exit time. Okay. Get rid of anything in transverse transition duration and do the same for the other one. Also disable fixed duration for it. We need to make a, a interact script for this. Perfect. So we'll call this um, toilet. What we're going to be doing is toggling an animation bool on interact. Okay. So we opened toilet.cs and we are toggling the animation bool that's in the animator. Uh -huh. uh, we're going to want to get a couple things first. We're going to need private animator, and we'll call it anim. I, I just always call it anim. That's just my personal thing. We'll actually be using void start this time. Why would we use void start? Start is the event that happens the first time that this object exists in the scene. That way it only has to think about this thing once so that it can establish certain variables and you don't have to worry about it causing lag for... One of the good things about it is you can throw as much information into these typically as possible. When it does that thinking, it's when the scene is typically starting so that it's not like constant or anything. So we are going to tell it which animator to use. So we'll do anim equals, and then we're going to do transform dot get component carrots parentheses in the carrots animator and right. semicolon at the end. Let's go do our uh, interact as well. Private void interact. This is an event that we'll be doing. So after start. Yep. Parentheses and brackets. Fun thing about putting scripts on something with an animator. Animators <laughs> like to think that if a script is on it, then, oh, all of the physics are going to be handled elsewhere. So normally you would put any update information inside of something called on animator update or something like that. But since we're doing this on an interact, we are actually going to have to make the button for this be something that is not the same object as the animator. Ah, so we're gonna make the child of this that's gonna be our toilet seat button. Uh, uh, you can just it. right click on the toilet seat in the hierarchy and do create cube. Uh, create cube. Nice. Oh God. Cool. Now you can get rid of the mesh renderer. Yes, and indeed. also probably check is trigger on the collider. I don't know if that's what you want to do or not. Yeah, yeah. we'll try that. That sounds like a All right. proper button. Now, we'll put toilet on here uh, okay. instead of on the toilet seat. You can uh, just yes. copy this it on behavior if you want. And then remove this one. Remove. All right, so we're going to have to change the script a little bit now. That's not on the same object as the animator. So where it says transform.getComponent, transform.getComponent in parent? in parent? In parent. There we go. And that'll do it. The other thing you can do is just change the animator anim to be public and then not set it on start. And you can just drag it into the inspector so that it can be just anywhere else in the scene. Animations are wild. Yeah, <laughs> we'll be setting the bool to the opposite of what it is. Anim dot set bool and the 
S and B are capitalized. We'll do a parentheses here because we have to give it multiple things. First, we have to do a string. So that string will be enabled in quotes and the E will be capitalized. So th this will be the bool that we're accessing in the animator. Uh, after that string, we will be giving it the value. And since we want it to be the opposite of what it is, we'll do anim.getBool enabled as a comma. So this will be the second part of this method. anim.getBool parentheses, then quotes enabled. What it will do after you put a exclamation point in front of anim is get its present state and set this value to the opposite of what it is right away. So if we put a semicolon right at the end, we'll have this line done and that'll be this script. All right, let's see if that works. Compile all Udon Sharp programs. Oh, oh, look at that. I made that animation myself. I'm pretty impressed with it. <laughs> It's very uh, true to form. <laughs> it opens and it closes, but someone closes it slightly too hard. Boof, boof. I should add sound effects. I love that. So now the moment of truth. There's one thing left in this to bring it from SDK2 to SDK3, and that is the moonlight. Ooh. Yes, we will be making the moon intensity change with a slider. And I don't have a slider on here because that was way too fancy for me. All right, so let's set you up one. All uh, right. Figure out where you want to put it. We'll put it on this obnoxiously sized tool cabinet. Focus against that point, no mouse click. Do game object UI slider. So if you scroll down, you'll see it created a few things that I need to point out in your hierarchy. There's a lot of things going on here. And if you're not familiar with the UI system, a few of these things can be a bit intimidating. For controlling UI, it created a thing called event system. We do not need that, delete it. You got it. That's easy. Now on canvas, any UI objects have to be within a UI canvas. Normally by default, it tries to just broadcast to the screen itself. Since that's a bad idea for VR users, we need to change some settings on this. So okay. over here where it says canvas, the first thing is render mode, and we're going to be changing this to world space. Done. All right. Now, uh, control shift F to put the object at the exact position of your camera All right, and scroll back a bit. This is your UI. At the moment, it's pretty big as most canvases are. So I would suggest putting the canvas scale at 0 0.01. To make UI interactable with the VR chat system, do add component and type VRC UI. UI shape, that one. Now you can use it in VR. <laughs> well, in VR chat. If you select the slider itself in the hierarchy, yep. click intercepted events. We don't need to look at that and it's just covering up a lot of the inspector. The only things that we have to worry about, unless you want to change colors or aesthetics, is the on value changed thing and the navigation thing. Navigation needs to be changed to none instead of automatic, because otherwise if you try to move left and right, it'll start like changing the values of the scroller and it's really annoying. On value changed, we won't do anything with that until we put a script on here. So now is when we make our script. We'll call this one moon slider. Moon slider. Here we are. We are going to need two variables on this. So two things before start. Private slider. Okay, so slider isn't something that automatically is something that's available to you because scripting doesn't automatically say, hey, I want to use the unity engine.ui. Put that right up here. Now you have access to the UI system. So you can just type slider and it becomes something. We're going to call this slide or slider or something. I'd probably just call it slide. We will want a public light because this will be our uh, target object. Public light lights target or target or whatever you want to call it. How about moon? Perfect. In the void start, give it the slider that is on the same object because this script is going to be on the object the slider is. So we'll do slide equals 
transform dot get component and then in the carrots slider and parentheses semicolon. So it seems to me like we're doing a lot of git components. Yep. <laughs> All right. So this basically looks and is like, oh, hey, that's where the slider is. So let's use that. We'll be making a custom event that will be accessed through the slider. After void start and all that stuff, we'll do a public void. We're going to have it be public so that other scripts can have access to it. Call it slider update. Then you'll give it uh, parentheses and brackets. In these brackets, moon dot intensity equals slide dot value. What this does is it takes the value of the slider and applies it to what the intensity of the light source is. Okay, save this and now we'll go back into Unity. We'll put the script onto the slider. Go to camp. slider. Yes. Yep. We'll go to slider slider add component. Uh, we call this moon slider. And we'll convert to Unity behavior. Hit the little dot next to Moon, and it'll search your scene through for directional lights, or I guess just lights. So all the lights, and we have a directional light, so we'll choose it. Now is when we get to play with on value changed. Do plus on the on value changed for the slider. You'll have to drag itself into that spot where it says none. Drag, drag slider. slider into slider. Oh, okay. Now where it says no function, we are going to be telling it to access the Udon behavior. And right at the bottom, you'll have to scroll down a little bit. It'll be send custom event. All right, send custom event. There, there it go. is. And we will be sending this the name of the method that we did. Which was slider update, yes. Click on the directional light in where you put moon so that it selects in the left so that we can look at uh, what the values are that it has. Currently, it's Probably. at point 0.2. That's a very low value. However, we can set this to be whatever you want with the slider. So when you click slider, it has a min value and a max value. You can set these to be whatever you want. We'll make it 0.3 and 0 0.02. As long as value right there, 0.2, is the value that the light is when you start it up, it's not going to like jerk as soon as you update the value. We have converted a SDK2 world into an SDK3 world using, what do you think, 15 lines of code? Yeah, it, it was all pretty simple uh, when it was the actual scripting parts. There were a few little hangups here and there of us actually just learning things. But but all in all, not bad. Thank you for this tutorial, Valgan. This is actually, I learned a thing or two, especially with how and when you want to actually attach scripts to certain things and just not bother touching other things like yeah. sometimes when i was like oh this this chair thing all right how am i going to disappear this chair well i'm going to need to have a script on the chair and i'm going to have to have a script on the object that i want to interact with and i want to pass variables between the two no you don't have to do any of that that's just a bunch of nonsense that's that's amateur level coding all you need is the thing this thing <laughs> all you need is to toggle some chairs invert them that's it for loop, an array. Perfect. Wow, <laughs> I'm blown away. All right, so now that we've been doing this for uh three hours, three and a half hours, we're gonna truncate this down into a nice twenty minute video and <laughs> and make it look like make it look like it was simple and easy, and everyone knows what what they're doing. Oh yeah, because because obviously I, I'm I'm a genius and get everything done first try. Absolutely, 100% yeah. factual. This video totally proves that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we. I think. I think he's gone mad. It, 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 it's past his. It's way past both of our bedtimes. Oh no! <laughs> All right, this is Shaney Merst here. That's Valgan. We will see Hello. you guys uh, next time, whenever that might be, for something, something else. <laughs> I'll see ya. Yeah, have a good night.